as of the time of our taping, the search is on. It is still on for a missing sub. The Coast Guard is spearheading the search off the coast of Canada. Now, the vessel lost contact with the surface an hour and 45 minutes into its dive on Sunday. It has between 70 and 96 hours of life support. That is according to officials. The deep sea sub named the Titan was taking tourists to visit the Titanic wreckage nearly 13,000 feet below the surface. Tickets for the ride are not cheap, costing nearly $250,000 each. So five people are on board, including a British billionaire, a French research diver, and one of the wealthiest businessmen in Pakistan, as well as his son, 19 years old. The CEO of the company that operates the sub was also on board. Here's what the Coast Guard said about the search operation on the Today Show. Our focus right now is really uh, on the search capabilities, and so we do have an understanding of where uh, the vessel, uh, the submersible, was operating, uh, and so uh, we're uh, prioritizing uh, search in those areas. Uh, the uh, Ocean Gate expedition is actually uh, leading uh, the underwater search area with assets that we're bringing in uh, to the scene because they know that uh, site uh, better than anybody else in terms of uh, on scene, in terms of the underwater search. Tiny. Wow, we were just discussing how like a small vessel that is. Now the, that CEO was interviewed about the sub a year ago when it first launched. Here's what he told CBS News. Take a look. I got these from uh, Camper World. We run the whole thing with this game controller. <laughs> Come on! It seems like this submersible has some elements of macgyver -y Jerry Rigness. I mean, you're putting construction pipes as ballast. I don't know if I'd use that description of it, um, but there's certain things that you want to be uh, buttoned down. So the pressure vessel is not MacGyver at all because that's where we work with Boeing and NASA and the University of Washington. Everything else can fail. Your thrusters can go, your lights can go, you're still going to be safe. Wow. So what do we think of this and what these tourists are going through? They are trapped in a cramped space, dark, running low on oxygen. I pray that they are alive. What are you thinking? Uh, first of all, I think about uh, it's we're talking about billionaires and they've lived incredible lives. I'm thinking about uh, Suleiman, the 19 year old student, the student, a kid kid with his whole life ahead of him. And uh, quite frankly, and I hope this doesn't sound harsh, it seems like a friv frivolous trip. Uh, I kind of have a rule. I don't know if the other parents do too, but no skydiving, yeah. no dangerous stuff until the kids are grown. Uh, I feel like they came here without, you know, they didn't have a choice in it. So it's my job to kind of take care of them until they're adults. Uh, but that, you know, putting that aside, I feel for the kid and just the terror. It's almost like your three nightmares of drowning, losing oxygen and it happening slowly mm -hmm. all at once claustrophobia. and a claustrophobic tomb. I've never seen anything this sad, Jeff. And I don't know if the equipment seemed up to snuff. I don't, I'm sorry. It just it put didn't. some extra it wires didn't. or something. That was a PlayStation controller. Yeah. yeah the, just so you guys know, it's 22 feet long, 9 feet wide, and 8.3 feet high. So you're really encased. It's not a lot of room. There's one portal, a toilet. They are now updating us, saying they have about 40 hours of oxygen as of this time of the taping left. And what's so scary to what Al was saying is you're staring at the other people. And what's eerie to me is you were visiting the Titanic. And it's just a weird, cursed kind of feeling that you were going to go see something that sank and now you're missing. I also think that CBS Sunday morning interview made me terrified for how Lucy, is there not a beacon? Is there not a tracer? You have to text with the people above and that takes a lot of time. It just seems not equipped for an emergency. That scares me. Yeah, it's, listen, I'm going to stay hopeful because yeah, they do have an area please. where they're looking, right? It is a needle in a haystack type situation because the ocean's so vast, but they do have a specific area, so they're not just searching the whole ocean. I was listening to some Navy pilot or captain, whatever you call them, um, and he was saying if you submerge like a different submarine that kind of picks up sound and sonars, if they're banging on the side, that's a lot more than looking for them visually to find a light or whatever it is. But at this point, they lost contact at some point, so it sounds like while they were going Going down something happened so if it imploded I don't know at this point if that's actually might be a good thing right as opposed right, to what I'm picturing in my mind right. of just slowly running out of oxygen and the panic and the fear with all those people on board so there is still time there's still time you know thoughts and prayers things like that but uh, yeah I just want to stay hopeful and we've been in incidents not like this 
per se, but similarly with, you know, the kids inside the coal mine. And I just pray that there is a happy ending. Mm -hmm. I really do, because we've seen situations where I've reported on it in the past, a long time ago in the beginning of my career. And I thought, wow, this is dire. Mm -hmm. Well, there's, I, there's also another question, Sam, and I want to ask you this. Is this was what, the third trip? The very, the, only the third time this has gone down. Is that December. enough time to start taking tourists anywhere? I like, do they so. do that Where with roller coasters? I, well, it's right. in, I was wondering, is it international waters? Is there maritime law involved? Right. This is off of Canada. It gets murky with ocean laws and jurisdiction. Right. Who's in charge of that, right? So I agree. I was like, where's the regulation on this I don't understand why thing? there isn't, and maybe I'm wrong, but from what I've read, that there isn't some sort of a GPS, some sort of a, a radar, beacon. something right. where you can locate where oh, they are. Uh, like I'll, I'll tell you this. I watched, uh, and I wouldn't, anybody that's scared to fly, I wouldn't suggest it, but I watched the disappearance of flight. Uh, the I Malaysian. The Malaysian too. Airlines. Yeah, 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 me too. And just like when they showed the ocean, I think the idea of like, oh, we'll just go find them because there's a sonar. Right. I don't think our brains can really understand. It's like trying to understand how much sand is on the beach. Right. It's 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 an impossibly large body of water in the depth and the the, the temperatures makes it really in the darkness. You know what unlikely. I was thinking of those kids that were trapped. Right. Remember what they did to survive? They meditated. Yeah. And it's if you can calm yourself down and they have a French diver on there. So if he can take Good the point. lead and calm everybody down, you got somebody who you got the owner CEO down there and the diver. Maybe they can calm themselves. I pray. Yeah, me too. Let's stay hopeful. Ooh. Yes. Woo. All right. Well, coming up on DBL, Dr. Coley will be joining us to talk all about the danger of losing oxygen underwater. What exactly are those people going through right now? Welcome back. We are continuing our look into the mysterious Ocean Gate sub disappearance, and we can only imagine what these people are going through. So to help us out, we have Dr. Pyle Coley here. Thank you, Dr. Coley. This is a very... Um, I, it's hard for me to even place myself in their shoes, and I try to always do that, but I'm just trying to, be, to remain hopeful. Yeah, Doc, we were talking about this, so it seems like they only have about 40 hours left of oxygen left, give or take. What's their situation like down there right now? If you, if hopefully they're still alive, and what is it like? What it's like on board? Honestly, I can't even imagine what they're going through. Their families, and so my heart goes out to them, and our prayers are really with them. But if in the best situation down there right now, if they have 40 hours of oxygen, hopefully all of them are still conscious. They should not be having any effects yet because they still have enough oxygen. But what happens, guys, when you're locked in a claustrophobic, small little container way below the ocean? What is your natural cycle? Psychological response. I would be panicking, panicking. in a way Panic. that, yeah. So what happens when you panic? You run out of oxygen. You <gasps> breathe harder, heavier, you need more oxygen, and you generate more carbon dioxide. So I am concerned that that's what's going on right now, that people are freaking out, that they're consuming oxygen at a faster rate, and if they're moving about more, trying to figure out what to do, how to send signals, they're tapping, or whatever we were talking about, all of that consumes more energy, and it consumes more oxygen. Mm. All right, well, I have to ask this unpleasant question, what happens when they run out of oxygen? Mm. You know, I can't even imagine because the human body is not designed to have an oxygen reserve. We have very little oxygen reserve and the equivalent of it is basically like holding your breath. Oh, yeah, yeah. How long can you actually hold your breath? A minute? Seconds or minutes, yeah. right. Yeah, and really, even if you're in the best of shape, it only is a few minutes that you can hold your breath without exhaling that carbon dioxide and getting fresh oxygen. So the brain needs oxygen to function and the organs need it to function. So the first things that happen is the heart starts beating harder because it tries to get more oxygen to the organs. Then the circulation starts shutting down. So your fingers and toes can start to turn blue because you're diverting the oxygen from the skin to the more central organs that are important. Once it starts affecting, the brain enough, you'll start to lose your vision. And that's why people talk about that light at the end of the tunnel, because you lose the side vision, the peripheral vision. You can only see what's right in the middle and the focal point of your vision. And then eventually, unfortunately, within a matter of minutes, you really start to get cardiovascular collapse, your heart stops, your breathing stops, your organs start to really give up. Golly. If you were on that sub, what advice would you give them right now? What a difficult question. I mean, the, the first thing I would say is that we really need to all put our heads together and figure out how we can devise a plan to get out of here. So that includes maybe some people lying down and just closing their eyes and meditating so that they reduce their metabolic demand and reduce their consumption of oxygen. And a few other select people, like maybe the older people, the, the people who are experienced with the sub, trying to figure out how to get them out of there. Because if everyone is running around panicking, trying to, or crying, or doing anything else that consumes oxygen, you're actually setting yourself up for failure. Mm. I know, it's hard to talk about. Um, our thoughts and prayers are with them. And again, this is at the time uh, 
of our taping. Okay, so Dr. Coley, we also wanted to get your opinion on this. The, the American Medical Association announced a new policy on body max index, okay, mass, I should say, or BMI, stating that it shouldn't be used as the main data point for, you're already shaking your head, for determining yeah. obesity. What prompted the change? You know, we've been talking about this for decades we in the medical the community. We hate it. We hate it because it's not a good marker prediction of risk because people with elevated BMIs cannot have many of those obesity-related problems and vice versa. Those with normal BMIs can have that. And secondly, it's racist. It's a racist metric. And a lot of things in medical medicine, unfortunately, the research and the data that we have is standardized to a Caucasian population. And the BMI is a really good marker of this because different ethnicities have different body shapes, mm. different sizes that are healthy for them. And so if you look at a South Asian, for example, they tend to run thinner. So if you're applying the Caucasian metrics to decide who's obese, you're actually misdiagnosing people, missing them. They're too late. As opposed to blacks or African Americans, they tend to have higher BMIs. And so if you're using Caucasian metrics, metrics for them, you're actually classifying people as obese who are not obese. Wow. So we really need to wake up. And, and in the medical community, there's already been a huge body of literature actually publishing ethnicity or race specific BMIs, race specific kidney function calculators. And the next that I hope to see is bone mass density, mm. because obviously your body size is different. Your, your you know, bone mass density is going to be different. And, and using one metric for everyone just doesn't make any what sense. What about cholesterol? Because I, when I was in your office, you talked to me about that and you said uh, black folks like our cholesterol is just naturally elevated. Oh, I didn't know that. So I didn't either oh. and I would have that would have told my people. Yeah, right. So I mean, I, I would, I would <laughs> like people. that to be out there. Uh, yeah, and different, I mean, South Asians are another example where they tend to get lean diabetes. They tend to be thin and they tend to be diabetic, which is different wow. than the obese diabetes that we see often in a Caucasian population. So we have different normals and we've been using sort of blunt objects, applying the same thing to everybody. And we're starting to get smarter in medicine, create more personalized medicine. And so the BMI is a marker in the right direction. Personally, I like to use waist hip ratio. Have you guys heard of that? No. Yeah. So go home, calculate your waist circumference okay. and divide it by your hip circumference. Okay. And that takes into account where you hold on to the fat. It takes into account what your body shape is. And we have normal cutoffs for men and women that are supposed to be healthier and those correlate better with outcomes. Wow. Interesting. Thank God for Dr. Coley. Thank you so much for stopping by. We appreciate you. DBL Nation, Dr. Coley does have a podcast uh, with a look into the life of a doctor. So check out Heart of Medicine wherever you get your podcast. Thank you again, Dr. Coley. Thanks, we'll Doc. be right back.